Hi, and welcome to my tutorials on Euclid's Elements, Book 5. This video presentation is going to be on Proposition 8 of Book 5. But before we begin, we need to look at some definitions. Now, I've already looked at Definition 4 before, but since it's used in this proposition, I just want to go over it briefly. To define two numbers that can have a ratio a to b, then there must exist a number p and q such that p times a is greater than b and a is less than q times b. If you cannot find two numbers p and q that do not satisfy this condition, in other words, you look through all the numbers possible and you cannot find anything that matches, then those two don't have a ratio. This is only true if one of the numbers is infinity or if the other one is infinitely small. The other definition that is also part of this proposition and is very important is the definition of what makes one ratio larger than another. So what does it mean when we say that A is to B is greater than C is to D? Well, what it means is, can we find two numbers such that n times a is greater than m times b, and n times c is less than or equal to m times it's d. 21 hours. If we can find two numbers, n and m, such that this condition holds true, then a is to b is greater than c is to d. And I gave an example here. Let's look at these two ratios, 180 to 85, compared to 125 to 70. Now, 2 times 180 is greater than 3 times 85, and 2 times 125 is also greater than 3 times 70. So 2 and 3 wouldn't be good numbers to look at. However, 2 times 180 is greater than 4 times 85. 2 times 125 is less than 4 times 70. So here we have n is equal to 2, m is equal to 4, we have, in this case, it's greater than, in this case, it's less than. So therefore, 180 to 85 is greater than 125 to 70. Now, I want to stress again that we're not proving that the ratio is greater. This is the definition of what it means to say that one ratio is greater than another. And we are going to use this proposition, sorry, we're going to use this definition in this proposition. So let's begin. First we're going to start off with two magnitudes a and a b and c, where a b is larger than c. d is some arbitrary magnitude, it doesn't matter what size it is. So a to b is greater than c, and assume it's not equal to d. Then this proposition states that the ratio a b to d would be greater than c to d, and inversely, the ratio of d to ab would be less than d to c. So this is what we are trying to prove. So let's begin. Now I know it sounds intuitive, but it's ratios, it's not numbers, so we need to actually prove it. So we're starting off with ab is greater than c, and neither of them need to be equal to d. First, Let's create a point E such that EB is equal to C. Then the lesser of AE or EB multiplied by some number will be larger than D. And that's from definition 4, where you can always find some number to multiply it so that it would be larger than D. In other words, this line's not infinity. All right, so let's look at our proof and assume that AE is less than EB. All right, because it could be the other way around, so we're going to take this as case one. AE is less than EB. We're going to define a line, FG, such that it is a multiple of AE and it is larger than D. So we've multiplied AE by two and it is now larger than D. Of course, here, what I've written down is in the more generic form where n 
is the multiple required in all cases. Now using the same multiple, so in this case it was 2, so using the same multiple, let's draw a line GH such that it is 2 times EB. GH is 2 times EB, or in the generic form, GH is N times EB. It is the same multiple. And we are going to make K the same multiple of C. So you can see here we have FG, GH, and K are equal multiples of AE, EB, and C. And FG is greater than D. So we've just drawn these lines. We haven't done anything with them. We've just created these lines. Now what we're going to do here, and it's a bit confusing in the proof, but what we're going to do is we're going to take n, we're going to take multiples of d, and we're going to continue to make multiples of d until it is larger than k. So at some point it has to be larger than k. So the first time that it's larger than k, that's when we stop. So n is going to be some multiple of d, and it will be larger than k. We take one less than that, m, and we say, well, obviously, since this is the first time it's bigger than k, go back one step, it has to be less than or equal to k. So m is less than or equal to k, and n is greater than k. And whatever this j is, we just have to figure it out, but m is one less than n in terms of the number of multiples. Stop the uh, video if you need to, to think about that if, well, if you need to, because this part here is very important. It's required further along in the proof. Carrying on, now we have FG and GH are equal multiples of AE and EB. So it's equal multiples of AE and EB. And from proposition one, if we have equal multiples of two magnitudes, then the sum of them together will be the same multiple. So in other words, FH is the same multiple. So FG, GH, and FH are equal multiples of AE, EB, and AB, respectively. Again, FG is 2 times AE, GH is 2 times EB, so therefore FH is equal to 2 times AB. That comes from Proposition 1. And they are all equal multiples. Now K is also an equal multiple because we've defined k to be an equal multiple, so fh and k are equal multiples of a, b, and c, respectively. Now gh is equal to n times eb, eb is equal to c, k is equal to n times c. Put these three equations together, and gh is equal to K. GH is equal to N times EB, which is NC. GH equals NC, K equals NC. So GH is equal to K. Now GH is equal to K, and we've defined K, or well, actually, we've defined M to be less than or equal to. Right. We've defined m to be less than or equal to k. Remember here, k is greater than or equal to m. gh is equal to k, so gh is greater than or equal to m. Okay, follow that? k was defined to be, or sorry, m was defined to be less than or equal to k. Or in other words, k was greater than or equal to m. k is equal to gh. So gh is greater than or equal to m. 
Now, GH is greater than or equal to M. FG is greater than or is greater than D. It's not greater than or equal to, it's actually greater than D. So if we add these two together, FH is greater than D plus M. You follow that? GH is greater than M. FG is greater than D. So when you add these two together, they have to also together be greater than D plus M. Again, if you need some time to think about it, just pause the video and look at this equation here and this equation here. So we have FH is greater than D plus M. But what is D plus M? Now remember, we defined M to be one less multiple of D than N is. M is J minus one times D and N is equal to J times D. So if we take M and we add another D, we have N. So here we have FH is greater than D plus M. So FH is greater than N. So now we have FH is greater than N. But N was defined to be greater than K. That was, remember we created the line N until it was greater than K. So by definition, we have constructed N so that it's greater than K. So we have FH is greater than N, but we have that K is less than N. And this is where we finally get to it. FH is equal to N times AB. N is equal to J times D. K is equal to NC. N, again, is less than JD. So if you look at this equality right here, these equalities, these two equalities, create the definition of when one ratio is larger than another. So here, because of this, we have AB, the ratio of AB to D is greater than the ratio of C to D. And this is by the definition seven of what it means for one ratio to be larger than another. So we have just proven that AB to D is greater than C to D, starting with this initial condition. So if this is our initial condition, this is the result. Now we can do the same thing to show that D is to C is greater than D to AB, just by going through everything we've gone through, but switching the signs from greater than to less than. So we're not going to prove this one explicitly. But now, what if we have our AE and AE is larger than EB? The proof goes practically identical, so I'm going to go through it much faster than I did with case number one. So we start off with AB is greater than C, EB is equal to C, so AE is greater than EB. We define our GH to be N times EB, and we define our FG to be the same multiple of AE, and K is equal to NC. Now, instead of making M and N on either side of K, we are going to do it to either side of FG. So we come up with an M where it's less than or equal to FG and an N, which is one more, and it is larger than FG. So very similar to the previous case, FH is equal to N times AB. FH is equal to N times AB for exactly the same reasons before. AE is two times, sorry, FG is two times AE. GH is two times EB. So FH is also equal to two times AB. Or in the more generic sense, FH is equal to N times AB. FH is greater than D plus M. Right, FG is 
greater than or equal to m. So fg plus gh is equal to fh. So this part here is greater than d, this part here is greater than or equal to m, so we end up that fh is greater than d plus m. All right, just to restate, this is greater than d, this is greater than m, add them together, the total has to be greater than d plus m. And d plus m is n, so fh is greater than n. Now k is equal to gh, because k is equal to n times c, c is equal to eb, which means it's n times eb, yada, 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 k is equal to gh. So if k is equal to gh, gh is less than fg, because we have eb is less than AE, and this is equal multiples. So GH has to be less than FG. And FG, we've just shown, is less than or equal to N. Not shown, by definition, we've defined FG is less than N. Sorry about this. This line here should be highlighted, not that line. That's why I'm getting a bit confused. FG is less than N. So gh is less than fg, fg is less than or equal to n, so k, which is equal to gh, has to be less than n. So we have k, no, let's start here, we have fh, which is n times ab, is greater than j times d, and k, which is nc, is less than j times d which again, this here is the definition to define the relationship between two ratios such that AB to D is greater than C to D, by definition 7. And therefore, we have all the inequalities that we need to prove this relationship. If we start off with AB is greater than C, AB to D is greater than C to D. And that concludes this video presentation. To see the next presentation, just click the next button.